Mm-hmm. What did your week look like? This is probably a question that you've been asked even today. Because this past week was a little bit crazy. It was a little bit challenging to say the least. And so that question of what did your week look like is actually the question that I want to ask to help us in this series. To get us from last week where we talked about Palm Sunday and to get us into today where we're talking about Good Friday. So I want to ask the question of Jesus, what did your week look like? If you remember Palm Sunday, he comes right into Jerusalem on a donkey. People are uh, screaming, Hosanna, save us. He's the deliverer. They're waving palm branches, laying them down, all these kind of things. Okay, so what do the next couple days look like? Monday, uh, it says that he went into the temple and said that they had turned it into a den of thieves. And he begins throwing tables and overturning all the the money changer stuff. And then he begins to heal people uh, on Monday. Tuesday was a great day. Tuesday is his last day of teaching the people about the kingdom of God. He shares many incredible stories, uh, many different parables that he shares, right? Uh, An earthly story with a heavenly meaning and just encouraging people to be faithful to God, remain faithful to God. Wednesday uh, doesn't really tell us what happened, right? Kind of a day of silence. And many, many scholars believe that Jesus spent the day in prayer on Wednesday, preparing for what was to come. Thursday is where he gathers his disciples to celebrate the Passover, right? The last supper takes place and Jesus explains what is going to happen, that he's going to shed his blood on the cross. And in doing so, people that believe in him, when the death angel comes for them, the death angel will pass over them because his blood has been shed and it has been put on the doorposts of their heart. Kind of talking about what we did last Sunday um, as we explained a little bit about Passover. Friday, this is the day I want to talk about right now. This actually begins Thursday night, right after this meal. By by this time, uh, the Passover meal has been taken. Uh, Jesus has washed his disciples' feet, showing them what it looks like to be a servant. He's already said that Judas is going to betray him. He's already said that Peter is going to deny knowing him three times. And then they take the Lord's Supper, right? Saying, this is the bread, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. They do this with the bread, then they do this with the cup. And we might understand a little bit about what this means, but 2,000 years ago, the disciples just didn't seem to get it in that moment, what Jesus was talking about. Well, right after this Thursday night, he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane where he begins to pray. And he prays so intensely that sweat drops of blood pour down from his brow. Wouldn't you like to know what he was praying about? Well, in John 17, it tells us, the Bible tells us that he prayed for himself, he prayed for his disciples, and he prayed for us. He prayed for you and he prayed for me in that moment, right? He prayed for us as believers, Well, right after this, he's arrested as Judas brings this mob and betrays Jesus with a kiss. And so beginning Thursday night, he starts to go through all of these different trials. And as he's going through them, he's beaten, he's spit upon, he's mocked. And by time Friday morning, he gets to Pilate, right? And Pilate says, I find no fault with this man. What do you want me to do with him? And the people are screaming, crucify him, crucify him, because the religious leaders have kind of stirred this up in the crowd. And so Pilate says, instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to offer to give someone back, release a prisoner to you. And so I can release Jesus to you, or I can release Barabbas to you. Now, Barabbas was a murderer who had been caught just a little little time before that, and people had cheered and danced in the street because he had been caught. He had been captured. And they say, give us Barabbas. They wanted Barabbas to be released instead of Jesus. And they keep going, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Well, Pilate, not wanting to crucify Jesus because he found nothing wrong with him, instead he ordered him to be flogged, right? And you might say, this is so much better. It's actually awful as well, right? Being flogged meant that there was a leather whip that had nine tails, right? A cat of nine tails. And at the end of these little tails, there would be tied a piece of bone or a piece of metal and people would be beaten with it. People would be whipped with it. And so much so to where when you would get whipped, one of those pieces would stick into your flesh. And and as the soldier would rip it back, it would rip out a piece of your flesh on your back, on your sides, on your chest, on your stomach. It would rip flesh from all over your body. There's a historian in the first century that says people were beaten so badly that you could see their vital organs through a thin layer of flesh. Right? People believe that Jesus was beaten so intensely that he was beaten beyond recognition. And so this is what we see. 
Then the soldiers give him a robe. They, they place a crown of thorns on his head. They give him a staff just to mock him as the king of the Jews. And they take the staff and they beat him over the head with the staff, continuing to mock him. They bring him back to Pilate, right? And Pilate says the same thing. I find nothing wrong with this man. But that's not good enough for the people. The people say, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And so at that point, uh, the order is given to have him crucified. And so Jesus takes the cross and he starts on what's about a one mile journey uphill. And at one point he is so, so tired that he actually falls under the weight of the cross. Really, really quick, I want to, as we get into this idea of crucifixion, I want to share with you Psalm 22. And I want to see if, if you think about what I think about when I read this. And I want to share a little bit about it with you. Psalm 22, uh, verse 16 through 18. It says, For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. I don't know about you, but when I read that, I think of the crucifixion without a doubt, right? Pierced my hands and my feet. My, my bones, I can count them all. They've not been broken, right? They're casting lots for his clothes. To me, this is Jesus. This is the crucifixion. The crazy thing about this is this was written by King David. 950 years before Jesus was born. Now, it, crucifixion wasn't even a form of torture back then at this time, right? 950 years before he was born. And, and, and the soldiers mocked him. When Jesus was on the cross, the soldiers mocked him. And they said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And the crazy thing is that Jesus could have. He could have saved himself. If you remember back when he was in the garden, Right, this mob comes and, and one of his disciples grabs a sword and cuts off the ear of a servant of the high priest. Right? And Jesus tells him to put a sword away. That's not how this is going to go. He actually puts the ear back on the man's head and heals him. He says, don't you know that at any moment I can have 12 legions of angels at my disposal? Right? A legion was 6,000. So Jesus is saying at any moment, 72,000 angels are waiting for my command to come in and help me, to come in and save me, right? He could have gotten himself off the cross, without a doubt. But praise God that he didn't, right? If he would have done that, it would have been over for him, and he would have gotten off the cross. But if he would have done that, it would have been over for us as well. It would have been over for you, and it would have been over for me, right? There would not have been a way for me to uh, be in right standing with God. There would have been no payment for my sin, that would provide me to spend eternity in heaven with God, right? If Jesus doesn't die on the cross, if Jesus isn't buried, if Jesus does not come back from the dead three days later, if he does not defeat sin and death in the grave, then there's no hope for you and I when we pass away as well. And so here's the thing. We were on his mind on the cross. We were on his mind on the cross. And Something that, that gets me is halfway through, three hours into it, the, the sky grows dark. The sky grows black. And, and he says something. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right? Literally a moment that we will never experience. This is a moment where God the Father turned his back on the Son because the Son was covered in our sin. All of humanity's sin was covering Jesus. And God turned his back on the Son. Right? Something that this is what he was also praying about in the garden for this moment, for this moment to happen. And then a few hours later, at about three in the afternoon, Jesus says, it is finished. This moment, meaning the payment for our sin is finished. That he paid a sin debt that we could never pay. And then Jesus goes on and he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he died. Jesus was taken off the cross he was put in a tomb that was guarded by Roman soldiers. And all the hope that people had had just days before quickly, quickly turned into despair. 